2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Last Sunday I made a strong statement from this pulpit. I said the chances are great that 50% of you, if you fell over dead right where you sat last Sunday, would have immediately dropped in the head. And I said that not to frighten you or to offend you, but because I love you. I love you. You see, most preachers don't love people enough to tell them that. Most preachers don't love God enough to tell the truth. But I love every one of you, and I love the Lord, and He's called me to preach the truth. And you see, it doesn't matter what kind of church it is, a Baptist church, a Pentecostal church, a Methodist church, whatever kind of church it is, there's a certain percentage that aren't saved. And there's a certain percentage of you here this morning who are not saved today. And it is my prayer, and it is God's will, for each and every one of you to not perish, but to inherit the kingdom of God. And so uh, some of you may have left here last Sunday asking, am I saved? Well, today, by, by the time we end this message, you're going to know whether you're saved and on the way to heaven, or you're going to say, I'm, I'm not saved, and there's some things that I haven't done as far as receiving Christ and so forth. So I do ask, and I rarely ask this, so I do ask for your undivided attention today. There are eternal souls of individuals who hang in the backs, and this may be the very last church service that they'll ever be, this may be the very last opportunity that they will have to receive Christ as their Savior. So I ask you children to pay attention. Let's try to limit the number of distractions and so forth. Satan would want to distract some folks any way he can to get your attention off of the Lord and on everything else. So I do ask for your undivided attention uh, today. I want to start out this morning by asking who has a birthmark in here? Who has a birthmark? A good many of you that have a birthmark. Where a birthmark is a reddish or brown marking seen on the skin of some newborn babies that typically remains visible for a lifetime. We're going to talk more about birthmarks a little later. But I want us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're actually going to read verses 11 and 12 actually. And I know they probably only have verse 12 up there, but that's okay. But I wanted to read verse 11 as well. Paul is speaking... In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, he says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, as Joy just saying, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Would you bow in prayer with me at this time, please? Father, we ask for your anointing. We ask for your feeling during this time. Lord, I pray that you might open the eyes of those who are blinded today. Well, we know that Satan has so many folks blinded spiritually in this world. Lord, we pray that the blindness would be open, that folks would see, and they would see the light and see that they need to receive Jesus Christ as their first Lord. Lord, help us to examine salvation and the subject of salvation like we never have before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to focus on that part of the verse, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. A little boy was offered the opportunity for his birthday to go to a pet shop and select a new puppy. Well, he went to the pet shop and he found a puppy that he liked whose tail was wagging furiously. And uh, someone asked the little boy, they said, why did you pick that particular little puppy? And the boy said, because I wanted the one with the happy ending. I wanted the one with the happy ending. He said, if you and I want a life with a happy ending, then we must choose Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Paul, who was considered the greatest missionary to ever spread the gospel, is in prison in our text, of course, for teaching the gospel. The prison was a cold and dark dungeon for Paul. 
Paul has done so much work for the Lord. Now his life is almost at its end, and he seems to know it. And the book of 2 Timothy is to believe to contain some of the last known words of the Apostle Paul. And let's look at that verse 12 again, and let's break this down for just a second. He says, I know, or I am sure, whom I have believed, or whom I have put my trust in, and am persuaded, or I have confidence and convinced that He is able, He's powerful, He's capable to keep, to preserve, to watch that, His soul, that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Notice Paul did not say, I know what I have believed. Paul did not say, I know how I have believed. But Paul's salvation was in a person, Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I know whom I have believed. He says, I know whom I have believed. Perhaps someone here today may know what Baptists believe. Someone might know how to be saved. But have you met the one who can save you? You know, we live in an age of expanding knowledge and information. You may be able to say this morning, I know how to change the oil of a car. You may say, I know how to send and receive emails. You may say, I know how to solve problems using the Pythagorean theorem. You may say, I know how to read sheet music. You may say, I know how to plow field. You may say, I know how to bake a cake. But, oh friend, can you like the Apostle Paul say this morning, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that death. Someone has said eternal life is knowing God through Jesus Christ is only Son. Such knowledge is life's greatest quest. Without it, life has not begun. When you and I get to the gates of our death, the rest will not matter. It will be whether you have trusted, whether you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior or not. Do you know Jesus today? Notice that Paul keeps the reason for his peace on Jesus Christ. He says, I know whom I have believed. He said, I'm persuaded He is able, had committed unto Him. All the emphasis is on Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is able to save. Muhammad cannot save. Buddha cannot save. Good works cannot save. No denomination can save you this morning. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Wherefore, He is able to save them unto the uttermost. Unto the that. Wherefore he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he live, ever liveth to make intercession for them. Only Jesus is able to save today. I'm going to say that again. Only Jesus is able to save today. Amen? Amen. He is. Only Jesus can. Are you going to heaven when you pass off of the scene, when you leave this world? People of all ages are dying every day. I'm almost 34 years old. It'll be next month. And I've made many bad decisions in my life. Some decisions were quite stupid. But I want you to know that Christ has forgiven me of all of my sins when He died on the cross of Calvary. And the most important decision that I ever made in my life was when I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I talked about my brother a few weeks ago. Well, he died some 15 years ago now. He was only 22. But after his death, the Lord began dealing with me, knocking, knocking on my heart's door. He did after my brother's death. And perhaps the Lord is knocking on your heart's door today. Can you hear Him? Can you hear Him? Let Him in. Let Him in. You and I can be sure of our salvation today. You can be 100% sure that whenever you die, that you're going to heaven. You know, two years ago I was eating with some ladies and uh, some older ladies at McDonald's and we're talking about heaven and one of them said, well, I hope that I'm going to go to heaven. I, I'm striving. I'm trying. Well, the Bible that I read tells me I just have to hope so I can know that I'm going to heaven whenever I die. How so? Why? Because salvation, again, is in a person, Jesus Christ. You see, salvation is not about who I am or what Jeffrey Ray has done. Salvation is not about who you are and what you have done. Salvation is about Jesus Christ and what He has done whenever He shed His precious blood on the cross of Calvary for you 2,000 years ago. He bore your sins there. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according 
to the riches of His grace. The way of salvation is not a secret today. The way to heaven is not a secret for you and me to try to discover. That's why Paul said, I know whom I have believed. You can know that you're saved this morning. You don't have to hope so like the ladies that I've talked to. Psalm 98 2 says, The Lord hath made known His salvation. His righteousness hath He openly shown in the sight of the heathen. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I'll say it again. That you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. This book, what's he saying in that verse? This book right here, the Holy Bible, God's Word was written so that you can know that you have eternal life. This book was written so that you can know that your eternal home will be in heaven one day. Not just so you can hope so, that you say, well, maybe so, but that you can know so that you're going to heaven. Amen? Amen. It was. You can have assurance that your salvation is sure and eternally secure. How so? Because again, salvation is in a person. Jesus Christ. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, your salvation today is eternally secure. You say, no, no, I believe if I sin that my salvation is stripped <coughs> away from me. Well, Hebrews 13, 5, God says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Some say, oh, well, He won't leave us, but we can fall away from Him. Well, that's not what Jude 24 says, but He says that He is able. God is able to keep you from falling. That's not what 1 Peter 1, 5 says, when He says that your salvation is kept by His power. Your salvation, if I had, if my salvation depended on me hanging on day after day, week after week, Monday after month, that I would lose it every day, every hour. But my salvation is kept in Jesus Christ because of what He has done. My salvation, your salvation, if you're saved today, is kept by the power of God. And none of us are more powerful than He is. Satan is not more powerful than He is. The Bible even tells us in Romans that the death cannot separate us from the love of God. He can. Amen? Amen. It can. So Satan would have you to believe that if you sin and you messed up somewhere along the way, he would have you to believe that everything's been stripped of you, your eternal home, the inheritance that God has promised to you as his child. Satan would have you to believe that all of that's been stripped away and that you might as well give up. You might as well doubt whether you're saved or not and, and worry about every little sin that you commit. And again, we should strive to not sin. We should not seek to sin. And a person that is saved will not want to sin. They will, they will, well, they'll want to sin. All people want to sin. But you're going to do your best to not sin. And so Satan would have you to think that once you fall, that's it. It's over. But the Bible that I read says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. So when you fall off of that truck, so to speak, that's, that's headed down the highway, you're not thrown aside forever. You can come back to God. He'll forgive you of your sins. And you're His child. You'll always be His child. Lance and Seth will always be my sons. There's nothing they can do about it. They may not like it. They may try to get away from me, but they'll always be the son of Jeffrey Ray. I'll always be their earthly father. Well, God, if you're His child, will always be your heavenly father. There's nothing that you can do about that. And, and say that God has made every human being here with a soul. And your soul is that part of you that no x-ray machine or any equipment that we have in any hospital can detect about you. Everybody has a soul. And your soul is your most treasured possession today. And your soul is that part of you that whenever you die, when you breathe your last breath, when your heart beats for the last time, your soul is that part of you that will either enter into heaven or either you will go to hell eternally. That's that part of you. These bodies wear out. We know that every day. They age. They decay. And one day we die and our body's going through the ground. 
and your soul either goes to heaven or to hell. And your soul is going to be restless. Until you feel the void, that void that's in your life with Jesus Christ. The psalmist said in Psalm 25, 1, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. So many today are trying all kinds of methods, searching for a remedy to fill that emptiness, the void in your life. Well, I want to tell you this morning, O restless soul, a drink of liquor will not do it. O restless soul, buying a new car or truck will not do it. O restless soul, going to another job will not do it. A wild flea will not fill the void. Watching a good movie will not do it. Money cannot do it. Painting a beautiful picture cannot do it. Pills cannot do it. Only when we like the song, say unto thee, O oh Lord, do I lift up my soul? Do we receive the pardon and the peace that only Christ can provide? Most are neglected and rejected. The only person who can help me with this business of soul saving. It said that a mother came to a governor named Governor Nash. He said, Governor, I've come to speak to you on behalf of my poor son who is soon to die in the electric chair. Governor, I've not come to ask for justice, but for mercy. Not for his sake, but for mine. You see, Governor, he's my only son in support. Governor, if you can do anything at all, do it for my sake. The governor promised to check into the matter and see if anything could be done. Soon he went down to the prison where the poor boy was awaiting his day of execution. When the young man saw the governor, the young man thought that he was a preacher of some sort who had come to speak to him. And the young man that was waiting his day of execution said to the governor, again, he, he thought it was a preacher, he said, uh, I don't have any time for you. It would please me if you would just leave me alone as he continued with his insults and so forth. But, said the governor, I have come to see you about an important matter, and you may be interested. The young man demanded that he leave him alone. Very well, said the governor. Goodbye. When the governor was gone, the warden of the prison came by to see the young man. He asked the young man, how did you and Governor Nash get along? Well, when the boy learned that it was not a preacher, but the governor, he fell upon the concrete floor in that prison and cried like a soul, lost and damned. He said, my God, have I rejected the only man who could save my life? And that's exactly what he had done. And that is just what countless numbers of people do every day whenever they reject Jesus Christ. He is the only Savior. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abide on him. As we meet today, every person in this room is either saved or you're not. Everybody in here say, what about the small babies and children? There, there's, right now, if they died, they would go to heaven. They haven't reached the age of accountability. But everybody in here is either saved or lost. There is no riding the peaks. So, as we look across this room, men, women, boys, girls, as we look across this room, some of you, if you fell over dead, would go to heaven. Some would go to hell. And I don't know which one of you which ones of you would go to which place? That's between you and the Lord. We hear what people say, but sometimes what people say and what people do are two different things. So, which one are you today? He is the only Savior. The most important decision is to know that when you die, you'll go up to your eternal home in heaven. A man was sitting next to a preacher on an airplane and uh, the preacher said to the man, he said, you look nervous. Are you all right? And the man said, I'm scared stiff. What goes up must come down. And the preacher talked with the man about his salvation. And soon that man dedicated his life to the Lord right on the airplane. The preacher asked that man, he said, do you see things differently now? And the man said, yes, preacher. If we go down, I go up. So I uh, think we're kind of understood. <laughs> Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Can you say that? This isn't a light decision. We're talking about eternal life versus eternal torment. And you don't have to wait. It can be settled here today. But just as we discussed a little earlier, there are birthmarks. Birthmarks. 
We've been reviewing Paul's thoughts just before his death. Let's back up in time for just a minute to his birth, his spiritual birth, that is. And remember we said the birthmarks or marks that appear on a newborn and typically remain visible for a lifetime. If you have been born again, if you're on the way to heaven, if you're God's child, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you too must have these birthmarks. And there are going to be six of them. If you don't have these birthmarks, we're going to see, and they're going to come straight from God's Word, not from me. If you don't have these birthmarks, then you're not saved today. That's what God's Word says. That's what God's Word says. So when we walk out of here in just a few minutes, I'm, we're almost through. When you walk out of here in a few minutes, you either have these or you don't. They haven't in your life or they're not. If you don't have these, then I would go searching and praying to God and asking Him to save you. Turn over to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and... And I don't know if we've got, I don't think we've got these scriptures up here, but you might want to jot these scriptures down in just a moment and read these a little later because we're not going to have time to read all of them today. I want us to notice the transformation in Paul's life. And we're going to see the way that God works in a person's life when he or she is saved. And I want you to inspect your own life and see if you have these birthmarks. And listen carefully. As I said, when you walk out of here, you're going to know your eternal destiny. First, in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, Paul met and he heard the Lord's voice. Paul is on the road to Damascus to arrest Christians, but the risen Jesus stops him and he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I'm Jesus. If you are saved, then at some point in your life, Jesus came to you. You had an encounter with the Lord. And you called out to the Lord. You said something like, I'm a sinner. And I need you, Jesus. Not only with the mouth, but especially with the heart. That's the way it was. And we see many salvation experiences in the Bible. The Philippian jailer, he fell before Paul and Silas. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. We read of Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken. Of Paul. How about the short statue Zacchaeus, who had Jesus had supper with and said, This done is salvation come to this house. These are cases where there was a happy ending, like the puppy. Others, however, like most today in the world we're living in, they reject Jesus and the gospel message. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful, rejecting Jesus during his encounter. King Agrippa said, Paul, almost! Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. No doubt the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come <coughs> to repentance. So how bad? Have you had an encounter with the Lord? If so, did you receive salvation like Zacchaeus, the Philippian jailer in Lydia? Or did you reject it like the rich young ruler and the king of Britain? Listen to God's voice today. Secondly, and we're going to go through these kind of quickly, notice... In verse 11, Paul began to pray. Paul began to pray. Paul has been blinded and he's helped to Damascus. And the Lord speaks to Ananias, a Christian, to go to Paul. And Ananias would find Paul pray. Pray. You want evidence that someone's a Christian? They pray. Yet another birthmark of a Christian is pray. Are you a Christian this morning? Are you on the way to heaven today? If so, you will pray. You will pray. Thirdly, in verse 18, we see that Paul is baptized. Paul is baptized. A saved person should be baptized. Not all baptized people are going to heaven. Why? Not everybody that's been dumped in this baptism pool or any other baptism pool is on the way to heaven. Why? Because they skipped number one. When they had that encounter with the Lord Jesus, they didn't truly receive Him into their heart, surrender their life to Him. However, now, if you are saved, you need to be obedient to our Lord's command and be baptized to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to have a baptism next Sunday. And we've got several candidates. And it rejoices our hearts to see new believers baptized. A mother looked out her window and she saw her little boy Johnny playing church with her three little kittens. And he, he had them lined up there, the three kittens, and he was preaching away to them. And, and the mother turned around to do some work and then she heard some scratching and some meowing uh, at the door. She went to the window and she saw Johnny 
baptizing those kittens there. And she was like, Johnny, stop that. You're going to drown those kittens. And little Johnny was as serious as he could be when he looked at her and he said, they should have thought about that before they joined my church. <laughs> yeah, get <kitten> provided. <laughs> Tell the world you're a Christian by way of baptism. Fourthly, in verse 19, we see that Paul was certain days with the disciples or he aligned himself with God's people, with fellow Christians. We too should unite in fellowship with God's people. Another visible birthmark of a saved person is church attendance. Again, all people that attend church are saved because the church cannot save, the preacher cannot save, no deacon cannot save, baptism, water baptism cannot save, only that encounter with Jesus Christ can save. So, uh, some come to church again and skip that encounter with the Savior. But a true Christian will desire to be in the company of other believers. Do you love the church today? Do you love the church? Fifth in verse 20, the Bible says in straight way to preach. That is, Paul preached. Paul began to testify and to witness. You may say, yeah, Jeffrey, I'm a Christian. I have the birthmarks. God spoke to me and I surrendered. I prayed. I was baptized. I go to church. I wonder, do you witness like Paul? Do you share Christ with others? Have you moved beyond the point of just sitting on the pew on Sunday mornings? Are you actively reaching others for Christ? How many people are going to be in heaven because you personally witnessed to them? Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, Have you no desire for others to be saved? You're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. End of quote. Strong. Strong. If you are truly saved, then you will want to keep as many as possible from dropping into the pits of hell. You know, atheists criticize us Christians. They say, surely, if y'all believed in a literal hell where there is burning fire, where no one will ever be released, you'd be out in the streets pleading and begging for people to get saved and get right with God. I wonder, Christian, do you really believe in a hell that people are going to burn in forever and ever we must get out of our comfort zone to witness? If you're saved, then you will want to share the most wonderful gift that's ever been given to you. Salvation, eternal life. Sixth and finally, in verse 22, Paul increased the more in strength, or he grew in grace. Just as we grow physically, we should grow spiritually as well. If you had a baby that was not growing, that was had become one, two, three, four years old, you'd become concerned. You'd become worried. Well, as a pastor of a congregation, as a Christian, if you're the same that you were last year or three years ago in your spiritual walk, then something's wrong. Something's bad wrong. You should be closer to the Lord today than you were a year ago. In fact, you should be closer to the Lord today than you were yesterday. In true born-again individuals, we see growth in their life. They grow. Things that are alive, they grow. They're no longer on a milk-only diet, but they graduate to some solid foods. You can pull up that last slide there. So, the birthmarks are an encounter where you met and you surrender to the Lord. You pray. You go through the baptismal waters. You united in fellowship with God's people. You witness and you grow in grace. And these are not just things, I'm going to warn you, these are not just things that we should do as a Christian. These are birthmarks that define and identify a Christian. And this is strong, but I'll say it again. If these are not true of you, if these six things are not true of you, then you're probably not saved. That's not what Jeffrey says. That's not some Baptist creed that's written somewhere. But that's what God's Word says. And we just looked at it. If you're, if you're saved, if you're on the way to heaven, then all of these will be evident. In your life. They'll be seen like a birthmark. This birthmark should be visible in your life if you're going to heaven. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith or not. Now, in conclusion, as Paul waited his faith in the dungeon in Rome almost 2,000 years ago, he wrote to young Timothy. 
Don't worry about me, Timothy. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He was convinced of where he was going when his heart beat for the last time. He was confident that he had an eternal home in heaven because of what Jesus Christ had done for him on the cross of Calvary. If somehow the Apostle Paul could write a letter to you and to me as we sit here this morning at Healing Springs Baptist Church, I believe that this is what the Apostle Paul would write to you and me. He would say, I know whom I have believed, and he was able, he was able to keep that which I committed unto him. Not only Paul, but Zacchaeus, and Lydia, the Philippian jailer, they could speak. Peter, Phil, John, Mark, Barnabas, and I could testify this morning. If your Christian loved ones, if my Christian loved ones could speak today, I believe they would not just say, I believe that they would shout this morning. We know and we have believed, and He was able to keep that which we committed unto Him. Amen? Amen. It would. No, sir, don't worry about Paul. Timothy, don't worry about Paul. Paul is with Jesus. Paul is with Jesus this morning. Can you, like Paul, say, I know whom I have believed? Are you confident? in Jesus Christ and getting you to heaven? Have you committed yourself unto Him? Have you? We don't have to worry about Paul. Paul was with Jesus. I'm going to read this and then I'll be through. I read a story about a man who was dying. His wife, son, and daughter came, who were all devout Christians, came to his bedside as he lay there. After some word of advice, he said to them, Good night. Meet me in a better world. He had one son, however, who was very wicked. He came and his father spoke some words to him. His father said to him, Goodbye, my son, goodbye. It touched the young man's heart. He said, Father, you said goodnight to mother and brother and sister, but to me you said goodbye. Why the difference, Father? The dying man said, My son, your mother, your brother, and your sister are Christians. And it will not be long before they meet me again in heaven. So to them, I said good night. But you are not saved. And I can never meet you again. So to you, I must say goodbye. The young man fell upon his knees by the bedside of his dying father. And he prayed a prayer like this. Oh God, I have sinned. I am sorry. I will turn away from all my sin and trust thee. And after praying, he arose with repentant tears flowing down his cheeks. Father, I do love Jesus, and I will serve him. The dying man with declining strength put his arms around his son, and he said, Good night, my son. Good night. I wonder if the end should come to you, your children, your grandchildren. If the end should come to you, would it be good night, or would it have to be goodbye? We talked about the child choosing the dog, the puppy with the happy ending. Will your life have a happy ending? As Paul looked towards his death, he was certain where he was going. How certain are you today? How certain are you? Again, remember, salvation is in a person, Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus today? Do you have the birthmarks that we talked about here? If not, you settle it today. I'll be down front. You step out from where you are and come. You come kneel and pray at the altar, maybe for some moment, love them. Some of you may have children that are lost this morning, that aren't in church anywhere. You come pray for them. You come pray for them. You receive Christ for yourself and follow Him in baptism. Maybe you're here, you never made a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and you want to surrender your life to Him today and follow Him in the Lord's baptism. You do that today. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank You for this time. As we've talked about eternal life, salvation, Lord, we've been challenged to examine our lives and see whether we be in the faith. And Lord, it's not easy to think about some of this. We'd rather just believe everything's okay with our souls and take our chances. But Lord, You've shown us. We saw the transformation in Paul's life that took place in Acts chapter 9. And Lord, when You save men and women and teenagers, Lord, the same transformation should take place. So Father, I pray if there's one here who's not saved, 
Oh, Holy Spirit, help that one to come forward today and see Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Perhaps there's a Christian here, Lord, that has been living for the devil. And Lord, doing the things the way the devil would have them to do. Lord, help them to forsake that sin and trust you and follow you. And Lord, just bless this time of invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you'll stand at this time as we sing our hymn of invitation.